Yeah, I think pretty much everyone has heard about it. So CryptoKitties are what is called uh, a non-fungible token, which is a really terrible term, but it basically means a unique digital asset. Uh, and what's interesting about non-fungible tokens is they're very diverse. So if you think about the number of uh, currencies that you use in your everyday life, um, it's probably not that many. There's cash, you might use um, maybe airline points, maybe if you play games, you use in-game currencies. But if you think about the number of assets that you own that are unique, it's actually quite a lot. So you might have event tickets, um, if you play games, you might have in-game items, you might own some domain names, you might own art, uh, even real estate is you can, it's a unique digital asset. So there's this whole design space um, that at OpenSea we think uh, the blockchain world has sort of uh, ignored and not paid nearly enough attention to. So we think that while the token boom was very exciting, uh, we actually think that there may be an NFT boom. Um, and it may just be a little bit different than uh, what we saw with the token boom, but we think it's actually even more exciting. So OpenSea, what is OpenSea? Um, it is a marketplace, so you can think of it like an eBay, where you can buy and sell all of these unique digital assets. So just like uh, Binance lets you trade tokens, we let you uh, buy and sell unique items on the blockchain. And what's different uh, between us and eBay is all of these are blockchain-based digital assets. And I'll talk a little bit about why that's, that's interesting. So here's a, just a screenshot of what the interface looks like. Uh, you can take any of these items and put them on sale in a variety of ways. So you could sell it for fixed price, you could sell it eBay style to the highest bidder, you could sell a bundle of these items. That is really a lot like eBay. Um, just a little bit of background on our platform. We've had four million collectibles uh, that we uh, pull into our system. We have now over 200 different games or projects that are building non-fungible tokens, uh, and we're the biggest marketplace. Um, that being said, it's a really small space, so we're big in a very niche uh, uh, user base. So why, uh, why put digital assets on the blockchain? Um, and just for reference, uh, I guess another question is, why did this CryptoKitty sell for, I think it was around 250 ETH, when uh, ETH was at a, like $1,000. So why did someone decide to pay that? So let's look a little bit at traditional digital assets. So um, I don't know if everyone's heard of Farmville, but it's basically a, a game that you play with uh, crops and land. Um, and it's a very unified experience. So it's its own ecosystem, right? It has the items in the game, it has some logic around how you use the items, it has its own, I think it might have a marketplace, it has its own user authentication system, and everything is kind of bundled up uh, in one unified experience. Um, CryptoKitties was actually very different. So CryptoKitties decided to build uh, assets on the blockchain, so they put the kitties as unique non fungible tokens on the Ethereum blockchain. And um, they said, well, instead of having our own authentication system, users will just have these assets in their wallet so they can kind of bring their own wallet, right? Um, most people were using MetaMask at the time, but now there's actually a lot of different wallets that you could use to play something like CryptoKitties. Um, and of course, they need to buy Ether to acquire the CryptoKitties. I probably shouldn't put a different exchanges or decentralized exchanges, but um, you need to get Ether, right? So that's sort of a component of this ecosystem. And the other thing that was interesting about CryptoKitties was uh, there were actually other games that you could use your CryptoKitties in. So someone came along and built uh, Kitty Hats, which is a way to accessorize your CryptoKitties, and someone else built uh, Kitty Race, which is a way to race your CryptoKitties together. And these were uh, projects that were completely independent of the CryptoKitties game, they just use the CryptoKitties assets. And similarly for what we decided to build was we uh, built another marketplace uh, where you could trade your CryptoKitties that, again, we never asked the CryptoKitties team whether we could do that, we just decided to um, build it. And then um, further down the road, you could actually connect CryptoKitties to uh, the DeFi ecosystem. So you could imagine um, taking a loan out one of your CryptoKitties using a protocol like Dharma, 
um, or maybe even using it as collateral in a MakerDAO CDP. So what this all leads to is uh, the difference, I think, at a high level between uh, centralized digital assets that we have right now and blockchain-based digital assets is just basically the difference between a closed economy and an open economy. So in a closed economy, um, you know, there's no free trade, uh, it's isolationist, uh, you can't import things, you can't export things. Um, and essentially the, the manager of the digital assets, like the game developer, for example, has to take care of everything, right? They have to figure out the proper amount of resources, they have to build the marketplace if there is one, um, and they have to worry about a lot of stuff. Um, and in a blockchain-based digital asset economy, uh, there's a lot more movement in and out. Things can be a lot more complex, but they're also a lot more modular. Um, and you can have entrepreneurship in these types of economies. In CryptoKitties, for example, uh, there were players that were able to make a profit uh, and sort of became these mix between people who wanted to play and people who wanted to trade and make money inside of the game. Now, all that being said, as we've talked about before, there's a lot of problems with blockchain-based assets. So the technology is very early. Um, there's not actually that many people who are using these things. The, I think the total number of people who own a CryptoKitty is still around 50,000. Um, and of course, for someone building blockchain-based digital assets, you have to worry about the loss of control. So these things could you know, be traded on a marketplace like OpenSea, could go to other games, and so that's kind of a concern. Um, so what are the properties that emerge when you build blockchain-based assets? So one is higher degrees of liquidity. Um, if you think about, uh, again, the, block, the digital assets that you might own, one might be your Twitter handle, right? Or your Instagram handle. And there's no liquidity for that because uh, Instagram decided they didn't want to build a marketplace for those things. With a blockchain-based digital asset, you can have liquidity sort of instantaneously, right? So this is a game called Crypto Space Commanders, um, and they launched uh, this game where you could fly these ships um, and even before they've built any gameplay, these items can be traded around. Um, this is a Discord user, so um, he's asking, he, he invested in this game where you buy digital land, and he's asking what's the price that we would expect, when will it be tradable? Um, and you can have uh, new sorts of market participants uh, enter the space. So this is a, a guy called DCL Blogger, and he's a virtual land investor. Um, so he buys up uh, land in a game called The Central Land, and he uh, figures out how to price it, and he's made quite a profit by uh, sort of figuring out how the market works. Um, and then as we talked about, custody uh, is a big difference in this new, with these new digital assets. So now there's tons of custodial solutions, right? Um, you could use a hosted wallet, and I think for mainstream audiences, that will often actually be a really great solution. Or if you want to manage your own security, you can use a, a, a wallet, like a, a hardware wallet or something like MetaMask. Um, scarcity is another property that emerges when you build uh, assets that are managed by smart contracts. So uh, this is an experiment by the Austrian Postal Service. And they built what was called a crypto stamp. And a uh, crypto stamp is a rare digital stamp that comes with a physical stamp. So whenever someone wanted to buy a physical stamp to mail a letter, they got this rare digital stamp and it was enforced the supply of this. So they said they would never issue more than 150,000 of these and there were only a certain number of uh, like red ones, right? And that sort of, those sort of properties are the same properties that you have with Bitcoin, right? There's a um, as long as the network may, maintains itself, there will only be a certain number of Bitcoin um, sort of predicted algorithmically by the properties of the network. You can have those same sorts of properties with uh, unique digital assets as well. And then persistence is kind of another interesting property that you get. So um, here are tickets for a conference we did, in, or we didn't host the conference, but we uh, built the tickets for it. And um, we decided to put them on the blockchain and put them on sale on OpenSea. And what's interesting about that is you might think of a ticket as even a collector item after you've gone to the event. 
Um, you could have things, actually this one in the middle is a um, collaboration we did with uh, Marvel for Deadpool posters. And these, again, they were persistent, collectible digital assets. And then on the right is a project that um, a game studio launched with Major League Baseball, uh, if you guys. Uh, another sort of an interesting um, example of this, there was a game called Crypto Assault, and uh, the game company actually uh, went out of business, so they, <laughs> they basically couldn't get it to work. Um, and uh, someone in the community who was playing that game uh, was, you know, had a group of developers who were interested in uh, continuing the game. So what they did was they just uh, worked with the original developers, kept the assets on the blockchain, and they're starting to build a new game around those assets. So these assets could actually take a life of their own after the original issuer of the asset decides to potentially move on. And then probably the most exciting thing for the gaming space is the idea of interoperability. So interoperability um, is this idea that these assets don't just live in closed ecosystems. They can live across many different environments in many different games. So here's a CryptoKitty that has become part of a Ethereum card game. Um, so that developer, again, didn't have to necessarily work with the CryptoKitties team, but they could import that item into this other universe. Um, a great example of this is CryptoVoxels, which is a virtual world similar to Minecraft. Um, and here, what's interesting is people are building museums of unique digital assets. So this is a CryptoKitties museum, um, and you can actually go and browse this today, um, and you can even buy the CryptoKitties inside of the virtual world. Um, and then, of course, these assets are interoperable with the rest of the DeFi ecosystem. So this is an item that's on sale for 8 die, right? Um, so everything that, every benefit that you get from other parts of uh, the Ethereum ecosystem are immediately applicable to these new assets. Um, so just to close things, uh, a little bit about OpenSea for folks who are kind of curious how we might be able to work together. Um, so we provide tools for building these marketplaces. So we recently worked with a company called Animoca Brands on an uh, auction for their Formula One uh, car game. And um, pretty excitingly, we recently sold one of these cars for around $100,000 uh, through a auction mechanic. And so what was exciting was the Animoca team didn't necessarily have to build their own marketplace. They plugged into our infrastructure and they were immediately able to sell these items. Um, so yeah, just to reiterate, um, OpenSea lets you deploy a marketplace pretty much instantaneously, and uh, that marketplace can also be customizable to um, fit your needs as a project developer. Um, and it's actually a lot easier than people think. So uh, building um, ERC-721 assets has now sort of become this base level standard that, um, you know, there's all sorts of tools for just minting an asset, um, there's, you know, the standard has solidified quite a lot over the last year, and now um, deploying these digital assets is almost like the for, sort of file formats we have with JPEG. It's, it's sort of assumed that it will work across a lot of the different ecosystems. Uh, market data. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> uh, and so then the last thing I want to mention is that um, we have a shared revenue model with uh, projects. So if you're deciding to build a game, um, you can actually have OpenSea power the marketplace, but you can earn a percentage of every successful sale. Um, so this is pretty interesting, right? Because with, uh, let's take eBay as an example, um, there's a lot of collectible companies uh, in the US that will issue rare cards, um, and they'll sell these packs of cards. And then the people who buy these, a lot of them will buy up a lot of cards, and then they'll sell them on eBay. Um, but the original producer of those cards never got to benefit from the secondary sale. Um, so with blockchains, there's the potential that things might turn out differently and you can sort of have a symbiotic relationship between marketplaces and uh, the original issuer of assets.
Uh, so this is one of our games. Um, they had over 4,000 ETH in volume on our marketplace, um, and they've earned uh, around 600 ETH just, just by using OpenSea's marketplace. So that's about it. Um, again, my name is Devin Finzer, and uh, if you guys are, if anyone is thinking about building non fungible tokens, uh, definitely interested in chatting. presentations um, and we are going to now start mingling and talking to each other.